If I had a $5,000 emergency, I do not know where I would get the money from as of right now, but I would find a way. I do not have an emergency fund. I think a lot of people don't save because they have to live paycheck to paycheck. I think that people don't save for emergencies because everyone's worried about today, and most people think, well, nothing bad can happen to me. I don't think people save because some people don't know how. If I had a $5,000 emergency, um, I would get it from family. I have to go to the father-in-law. I guess I would have to go to my bank and see if I could get a loan. Yeah, I would use my home equity line of credit. Probably get it out of my assets out of my house. Personal loan through the bank. Or I could put it on a credit card. I don't think people save for emergencies because we just don't plan ahead and we don't think an emergency is going to happen to us. If we were to have an unplanned expense, I feel we are financially sound enough to do that. We have access to emergency funds like uh, stock options and some savings. I've invested over time uh, both in real estate and in the stock market. The way that we most recently paid for an unplanned expense with her truck repair, um, she sold some of her 4-H steers and that money is going to pay to repair her truck. Most people don't think about tomorrow. I think about tomorrow, the day after, the day after, and the day after. Please welcome nationally syndicated radio host and New York Times best-selling author, Dave Ramsey. Thank you. Well, welcome to Super Saving Common Sense for your dollars and cents, learning to save money. Now this is something everybody knows they're supposed to do, but no one does it. And what we have found about all of these financial steps and all throughout Financial Peace University, we are gonna lay out a step-by-step -step game plan for you to be able to win. The core, the outline, the bones, the skeletal structure of that whole process is called the baby steps. Now the baby steps work like this. I have figured out that if you do little things all in the right direction long enough, eventually you get there. You don't have to make huge strides. You don't have to be real flashy. All you got to do is put one foot in front of the other and keep taking a baby step at a time. If you'll keep taking step after step after step after step, you get to win. And so we've laid this out, this process of personal finance, into an idea that gives you a step-by-step -step process. The first thing to do, then the second thing to do, and then the third thing to do. We're going to talk about that starting right up front and starting right now. As we go through Financial Peace University, I'm going to make you write the answers in your workbook. The, the, the answers will be on your screen, and we'll have all kinds of exhibits and props and jokes. We're going to use all the tricks of the trade to make sure you enjoy this process of learning and that you actually learn. You know, money moves around. You have to make money behave. You have to make choices with it. And so our first choice is we're going to engage the baby steps. Now, what I've decided to do is I got people that have actually won in some of these areas of the baby steps, and they've actually accomplished the step that we're going to introduce to you, and they are going to help us introduce the baby steps each time. So that's the process. Now, let's talk about the baby steps. Baby step one is $1,000 cash in the bank. That's your very first one. I want you to do that really, really quickly. And baby step two is you, put, you do the debt snowball, and we're going to work on that in the debt lesson in detail on how to get out of debt. And then baby step three, you're going to finish your emergency fund three to six months of expenses and savings. Baby step four is invest 15% of your income, and we're going to do that with the investing lesson and with the lesson on retirement and college planning. And baby step five, college funding. We're going to go through that whole process as well, show you how to do that. Six is pay off your house early, and the last baby step is build wealth and give a bunch of it away. We're going to teach you to live like no one else so that later you have the opportunity to live like no one else. We're going to teach you to live like no one else so that later you have the opportunity to give like no one else. And we're going to walk you through this again, step by step by step. So let's see what these folks had to say about baby step one. A thousand dollar emergency fund means security. The very first thing is to put that thousand dollars in, in there. It was easy to do. It took me two weeks. I have a thousand dollars in my emergency fund. I finally understood the importance of having a thousand dollars in the bank. I had never had a thousand dollars in the bank ever. I have an emergency fund and um, I'm taking the baby steps and I have at least about, about $4,000 in my, in my uh, emergency fund. 
the emergency fund being there, we don't have a lot of those financial uh, emergencies that come along. I don't know how I ever made it through life without savings, but I learned the value of that. We have an emergency fund, which feels great, and we have a plan. And now I have it, and it's the most important thing. I won't, I won't do anything to touch that money, because that is, it is my safety net. Baby step one, quickly, I want you to get $1,000 in the bank. Or you could just put it in the underwear drawer if you want. You know, you could store it anywhere you want to store it. But the trick is this, you got to put it someplace where you can't get to it too easy. So maybe the underwear drawer won't work, because maybe the pizza man will get your money. No, the pizza man's not going to be in your underwear drawer, but I know what happens. I know what happens. He comes to the front door and says, ding dong, the pizza's here. And you go, ooh, ooh, this is an emergency. So you got to put it where you can't get to it too easily, but you also got to put it where you can get to it if you need it, because it is there just for emergencies. Most people can do this in a month, and you need to do it really, really fast. Baby step one is the easiest baby step, and baby step one is the hardest baby step. It's the easiest baby step because it's only $1,000. By the way, if you make under $20,000 a year in your household, mark through that and make it $500 because I want you to do this really, really quickly. So again, it's the easiest because it's a small amount of money. You have a big garage sale. You work a little extra. Boom. You can get this thing done right now in one month. Knock that one out. Some of you already have $1,000. You're going to check that off. I'm ready to move on, right? Now here, it's the hardest baby step though because it means you've got to decide if you're going to climb this ladder or not. You've got to decide, am I going to take these steps? Am I going to change my behaviors? And when you make that decision, it's a big deal. Because I'll tell you this, human beings do not like change. We drive the same way to work every day on the same road. We wear the same clothes all the time if we're not careful. We, 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 you know, <laughs> we do not like change. We sit in the same place in church every Sunday. I went and spoke at this little church one time. I was sitting down, sitting down front, getting ready to go up, you know, kind of on the front row there. And this little blue-haired Jesus lady came down there and said, you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> and, you know, those little blue-haired ladies, they're close to Jesus, so you don't mess with them. <laughs> so I got up and said, yes, ma'am. Right? But here's the deal. We don't like change, even if what we're doing is not working. We're proud of our stupidity. You know, we become defensive of our mess, don't we? We're like a toddler sitting in a poopy diaper. Yeah, I know it smells bad, but it's warm and it's mine. <laughs> we are defensive of our mess. Even if it's not working, we don't like change. So this is when you decide if you're going to change or not. This is when you make the decision. So it's the hardest baby step because you gotta face you. You gotta look in the mirror and go, you're the problem. And when you do that, then you start to win with money. See, what we're talking about here is, is that savings must become a priority, not an intellectual discussion, because I've never interviewed somebody that says, no, I think savings is dumb. I think saving money is a really dumb idea. I've never heard people say that. But everybody talks about it, and no one does it. This is where you actually have to learn to decide to pay yourself first. You need to learn to give, save, and then pay bills. And i got to tell you, when I first started doing this stuff, I was weak. It was hard for me. And I had to learn to just take my giving, my tithing as a Christian, off my budget, my saving off my budget, do it over here, and budget with what was left. Because if I ever put it up there on the budget, it would kind of sink down in there. There was always something that seemed a little bit more important that would jump up and bite it. And, it would, and, I, and I wouldn't be giving like I wanted to, and I wouldn't be saving like I wanted to. You've got to make it a priority. Let, let's kind of talk about it this way. How many of you in here have children? Raise your hand. Once I get your hand up, keep it up. Now, if you have children, how, and how many of you? Keep your hand up. If you don't have children, how many of you hope to someday? Or there's a child anywhere on the planet you kind of like? <laughs> okay. Now, that's just about everybody, right? So stay with me here. Now, you can put your hands down. But let's pretend for a second... That, that a disease had broken out. That would be awful. And there was a vaccine that was needed to save the life of your child. And that vaccine was going to cost $5,000 cash, and you had to save $5,000 cash by the end of the year. You had to save $5,000 cash by six or eight months from now. And you couldn't go get it. You had, to, you had to change your behaviors and save money. If it meant the life of your child, how many of us could find and save $5,000? One lady's like, which kid? <laughs> but we could do it. All that means is this. 
Now, obviously, that, we didn't give you a raise. We didn't give you a budgeting technique. We didn't give you some magic pill to make you rich. You changed your priorities. In that horrible, macabre example, you looked at it and you said, if I had to, I could do it. If it became important enough to me, I could do it. You would reprioritize your life. Let me tell you what, that's when people start saving money, when it becomes important. And it's important because I tell you what, we got people, we've got a whole culture wandering through life like Gomer Pyle on Valium. <laughs> and they wake up at retirement and go, Shazam, I'm broke. I sure hope the government, which is well known for its ability to handle money, will take care of me. <laughs> this is a dumb plan. Saving money as a way of life is an exercise of character. It's an exercise of emotion. It's absolutely vital. You know, the U.S. has a negative savings rate. And co countries like Japan and European countries, many of them have a positive savings rate. You know what a negative savings rate means? That means we are spending more than we make. Hello. That's not hard to figure out, is it? We're spending more than we save. We're eating into our savings every year. We have a negative savings rate. That's got to change as a culture or we're going to fail. Saving money is about emotion and it's about contentment. When we use that example of the vaccine with a child, your emotion gets you and you say, I can, ah, I can do this. Ooh. And it's also about contentment. It's about, you know what, I don't have to impress you. I don't have to buy something to feel good about myself. It's okay to get me some stuff, but I'm just gonna be okay where I am because it's more important for me to be able to have some savings to go to college, send my kids to college, to retire with dignity, to change my family tree, to have some stability for the first time ever in our household. That's more important than buying that thingy. And I'm not against thingies, but there's a process here that you've got to engage in. It has to become very, very important. And our parents never talked about savings much. For that matter, in a lot of households, parents didn't talk about money, did they? Our parents didn't talk about money, they didn't talk about sex. We figured they had neither, turns out they had both. <laughs> And so we got to talk about this out loud. We got to say savings matters. You know, according to the Employee Benefit Research Institute, 58% of American workers have never even calculated what it'll take for them to retire with dignity. And 59% said they hope to have a standard of living equal or better to their working years. Now listen to this. 58% have never run a calculator, look at it, but 59% have hope of being better. What kind of stupidity is that? That's total disconnect in the way we're looking at money, in the way we're handling money. It doesn't work. Well, if I save money and I do the stuff you teach, I'm going to become rich and evil. And if I have money, I'll be an evil rich person. Yeah. <laughs> There's a plan. But haven't we gotten this disconnect going there, seriously, where we think that everybody that's got money is evil or something? Sometimes we watch too much TV, I think. You know, the truth about money is, is that money is amoral. That means it doesn't have morals. It's not good and it's not bad. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. It says the love, love of money is the root of all evil. See, that involves a human being. It doesn't involve money. Money doesn't have morals. It's not good, it's not bad. It doesn't make decisions. It functions based on what you or I do with it when we touch it. When we put it in the hands of a human is when we see it change. Now, it's kind of like this brick. This brick is amoral. I can take this brick and throw it through a plate glass window. Or I can take this brick and build a hospital or a home for unwed mothers. I can take this brick and build a clinic in a neighborhood that doesn't have one. The brick doesn't care. It's just a brick. But when you put it in the hands of a human, it starts taking on life. And then we say, oh, that guy's got a bunch of bricks. He must be evil. <laughs> or that one has no bricks. He must be good and we start making these judgments, it's just a brick. Let me tell you, how, I, let me tell you, I have met rich people who are total greedy jerks. Have you? Say yes. yes. I have met poor people that are total greedy jerks. Have you? Yes. I have met poor people that are some of the most godly people on the planet, haven't you? Yes. I have met some rich people that are absolutely incredible human beings and do all kinds of cool things with their wealth and are some of the most godly people on the planet, haven't you? Yes. You see, it's not the money, is it? If you're a jerk and you've got bricks or you're a jerk and you haven't got bricks, you're still a jerk. <laughs> money is amoral. You're not bad because you've got some. You're not good because you don't. It doesn't work that way. It's just 
money. That's all it is. Now, the only difference between saving and hoarding is not an amount. See, sometimes you look at someone else and say, well, if I had that much, I would do. Yeah, right. You had not been there. You don't know. See, the difference in saving and hoarding is your attitude. It's your heart. That's what Larry Burkett used to say. Some people have $10 and they hoard that. Others have $10 million and don't hoard that. See, what I'm talking about is this. You've got to learn to save money. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. Wise people save money. And then when you get a pile of money, whether it's a big pile or a little pile, how you treat that, your attitude towards that, tells us whether that is saving or whether that is hoarding. That is a spiritual and an emotional, a philosophical way of looking at that money. It kind of is like this. You know, here's the deal. This is the international sign of anger, the fist. And, and if you hold your hand open like this, even a dog understands that. See, if you hold your money like this, it will never get out. But guess what? No more can get in either. It doesn't work that way. The clenched fist is the hoarding idea. The open hand allows money to come and go, and, and you've got a different attitude in the way you're looking at it. Now, let's look. There are three basic reasons that we save money for. Number one is for an emergency fund. Number two is for purchases. Number three is for wealth building. When the emergency fund is involved, what we're saving for here is unexpected events. Unexpected events do occur. You can count on it. Grandma said it. Grandma said to save for a visual aid. <laughs> it's going to rain. Money Magazine says 78% of you will have a major negative financial event in any given 10-year period of time. That means 8 out of 10 of you in here, if I count 10 families, are going to have something come along and punch you to the tune of seven, eight, five thousand dollars $5,000, somewhere in that range, and, and, and hit you with an unexpected event, and you have to be ready. Emergencies are going to happen. They're unexpected. Count on it. Well, Dave, you, you need to be positive. I'm positive. Emergencies are going to happen. You can count on it. And you've got to be ready for the emergencies. There's no way around it. We had one lady going through Financial Peace University years ago. She sat down. She told us, she said, my grandmother always had the GOK fund. And the GOK fund, one time when I needed braces, put braces on me. And the GOK fund, one time when, when Grandpa had a car wreck, we fixed the car with it. And, and the GOK fund, once when there was a sick neighbor, we paid for the sick neighbor's bills. And the GOK fund was always there. The God only knows fund. The emergency fund. It really has to be there. You have to think about this. And so here's the deal. Unexpected events aren't really unexpected. So they're not really unexpected events, are they? Let's try it this way. Everybody take your fist like this and put it right up in front of your face, kind of like this, okay? And then take your hand and place it across the back of your wrist <laughs> and curl your fingers around until you find your pulse with your fingertips. Is your heart beating? Good. Then we don't have to haul you out. If your heart is beating, unexpected events are going to occur. Get ready. You're not exempt. You are in the human race. There's a chance it's going to happen just for you. Now, remember, baby step one is $1,000 in the bank. We're going to set aside $1,000 really, really quickly. The hardest baby step, the easiest baby step. And, and then when we go fully into the emergency fund, we're going to call it baby step three. And you notice we skipped a step. We'll come back and fill that in later. But these two both have to do with the emergency fund, so I want to make sure they're covered in this lesson. Here's what some folks had to say about baby step three. We're working on the three to six months of savings. We've almost got four and a half months saved up. So the wheels started turning faster once we got rid of all the debt. Now we've got our, our emergency fund almost funded. We have more than six months savings in our emergency fund. I now have six months of an emergency fund on hand. It felt wonderful to have a fully funded emergency fund. Uh, the security in that is amazing. Baby step three, have a fully funded emergency fund of three to six months of expenses set aside. Now, I recommend you put that in a good money market account. 
A money market account you can get with a good mutual fund company. It doesn't pay a lot. It's going to pay kind of like CD type rates. Whatever CD rates are, over about six months you can have this on a money market account. The good news here is there's no penalty for taking the money out if you have an emergency. You can just write a check against that money market account. So it's where I park my personal emergency fund or where I park short term savings for stuff I'm saving for less than five years. So if I'm saving up for other things that we'll talk about in a few minutes, I also use a money market account for that. Now, what you've got to remember, the mistake people make about the emergency fund is they think, ooh, 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 this is like $5,000, $10,000, $15,000. Three to six months of expenses is a lot of money. You start talking about having $15,000 sitting there in a money market account, people are saying, well, that doesn't give me much of a rate of return. I could do a BBD. I could do a bigger, better deal. Dave, I've got something I can do with that money. That's a lot of money. And that's not what it's for. Your emergency fund is not an investment. Say, not an investment. Not an investment. Your emergency fund is insurance. Say, insurance. insurance. Now, here's the deal with insurance. Insurance doesn't make you money, does it? Say, no. no. Insurance costs you money, and it costs you money to protect your assets to protect your investments and so by investing money at a low rate of return or parking money really in a money market at a low rate of return you're not making much money on your money so it's kind of costing you money like insurance does but it's there to protect you so you don't have to cash out your 401k if the transmission goes out you don't have a problem if you get laid off and have to pay the house payment a little bit you go you got issues that are gonna happen when life comes along and there's a five thousand dollar an eight thousand dollar or twelve thousand dollar gotcha then all of a sudden you're not trying to cash out investments because it's got you've got protection for the investments with this the trick with this is don't touch it do not touch it this is not a leather couch fund this is not a I want to go to the Bahamas fishing fund. This is not a oh honey, I found a bass boat fund. This is an emergency fund. You do not touch it. And once you get that in place, it will cause you to relax. It'll give you a sense of peace, a sense of destiny with your money. It is a huge emotional step in your financial process. Never, never, never miss this. I remember I was doing a book signing a while back, and this lady came, and she came in the book signing, and she was just, she was kind of, it was in the summertime, it was in August, and, and she was just, well, she was sweaty. It was a lady. She had perspired, okay? <laughs> but, but she came up, and she's like, I'm so mad. She said, I'm so mad. I was coming over here to get my stupid book signed by you, and, and, and the, 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 the whole rear end just went out of the truck. And she said, I've been doing this stuff. I've been in Financial Peace University. I saved up $12,000, and, and the truck is sitting out there on the street. It's just, I'm just so mad. I said, why are you mad? And she, I said, how much is it going to take to fix the rear end of the truck? She said, oh, it'd probably be over $1,000. I said, you have $12,000. What are you mad about? She went, well, I guess that's true. <laughs> because she was just like me. Her whole life before that, every time the car broke, we had a car crisis and a financial crisis. And so we, our emotions are, are trained to where when the car breaks, we just go into orbit. Because it's not only an inconvenience with the car, there's also getting to be a financial whammy here. And, and she had, had never stopped and thought, I've got $12,000, I can just fix the car. And the weird thing is, when you get an emergency fund, you'll quit having emergencies. Have you ever noticed that when you're broke, your life looks like a country song? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Everything that can go wrong will. Murphy shows up. You know who Murphy is. The guy, if it can go wrong, it will. I am convinced that when you have an emergency fund, it is Murphy repellent. <laughs> that, that Murphy that comes up, knocks on the door, and he said, I've got an emergency fund, $12,000. She goes, okay, I'll go see your neighbor. <laughs> you know, you can chase a black cat when you've got an emergency fund. Come here, come here. It is amazing to me how this works, that Sharon and I, we got that emergency fund in place, and with what we've been through, going broke and losing everything, I mean, honey, we got an emergency fund for the emergency fund. <laughs> We're like conservative, right? We, don't, we just don't want to even go near those kinds of pain ever again. We, there's no chance. So we got this huge pot. And once we got that, we don't even use the emergency fund for emergencies. Something comes up, we just kind of work it out. But we don't have big emergencies like we used to. Because everything was a crisis when we had absolutely no dollars. And when you put some pad between you and life, 
Life will leave you alone a little bit in the negative ways anyway. The emergency fund is your first savings priority. Do it quickly. Do that $1,000. Then do baby step two when we cover that in the debt lesson. And then step up there and finish this emergency fund. Fully funded, three to six months of expenses. The second thing we teach you to save money for is for purchases. Instead of borrowing to buy something, pay cash by using the sinking fund approach. For instance, let's say you had a $4,000 dining room set and you went down to rooms there they went. <laughs> and they would have, if you went to the local furniture store, right, and you went down there, there's a $4,000 dining room set, they would have 90 days same as right? And, and you could go in there and you could finance it. Well, here's the trick. A buddy of mine in the finance business told me the other day that 88% of the 90 days same as cash contracts, that's 9 out of 10, do not pay off in 90 days. And when they don't pay off in 90 days, or even if you pay a little payment you're supposed to pay through there and you don't pay it on time, they'll still tag you and they back charge you through the whole thing with the interest and then you get to pay payments for the rest of your dad blame life at 24 or 38% interest is the way this deal works. And they kick you in the tail. So this means that you're going to have borrowed at 24% interest. You'd have payments of $211 a month as an example for 24 months. And so you'd end up paying $5,000. $64 for a $4,000 dining room set. Here's an idea. Here's an old-fashioned thought the way your grandmother would think or your great-grandmother would think about money. Here's an idea. Here's what a sinking fund is. It's a commercial real estate term. If you buy a commercial real estate building and it's got a 20-year roof on it, you know that in 20 years you've got to buy a roof, so every year you set aside out of your income 1 20th of the roof. So when the roof, which is a big hairy deal on a big building, comes up, you've got the money to put the roof on it. It's not a surprise. That's a sinking fund. And that's all we're doing here. We're just going to save money and earn a little bit of interest on our money rather than paying someone else payments and being stuck in a rut. And so what if you save $211 a month? You did this for 18 months. You could pay cash. Now, some of you are quick with a calculator or quick with your math, or you'll go back later and run the numbers. You'll go, now, wait a minute, 18 times 211 is not 4,000. You're right, it's not. 18 times 211 is actually only $3,798, 3,800 bucks. But you know what I've discovered? Did you know that 90 days is not the same as cash? <laughs> that, that if you have 38 Uncle Benjamin Franklins, that you could probably walk into a furniture store and get a deal, couldn't you? Do you, do you think I could buy, do you think you could buy a $4,000 dining room set for 3,800 bucks doing that? You, you'll get special attention if you just walk around and do this right here. <laughs> because they just don't, they're, they're, the kid, you go up to ring it up and the kid will go like, well, dude, this one's got like real money. <laughs> you know? And so it, it's a cool process. You can, you can get deals like this, and we're going to talk about that in the bargain lesson, so don't miss it. So 90 days is not the same as cash. Now, do all furniture stores always discount when you do that? Well, absolutely not. Do I leave with my money if they don't? Absolutely. <laughs> because I'm going to save up and pay for it. And, you know, you start paying for furniture that way, you're going, I'm not sure I like the furniture. I kind of like this. I'm just going to go home. You know what I'm saying? Or, or let's think about a car, for example. Let's kind of look at that. Because everybody's saying, ooh, car payments. You always got to have a car payment. That's the thing that goes around all the time. We'll talk about that in detail in the debt lesson. But what if you had a $4,600 car? You could save for a $4,600 car, and you could do that by putting $464, which, by the way, is the average car payment in North America today, according to USA Today. If you put $464 just in the cookie jar for 10 months, not even a whole year, and then you could buy a car. Well, now, Dave, $4,600 won't buy much of a car. It'll buy a car without payments, <laughs> and it will do it in 10 months. And did you know I can drive out a state highway that way about 20 miles, or I can drive out a state highway about that way about 20 miles, and you could too, and I can buy me a 10-year-old Honda Accord that is a very, very nice automobile for 4,600 bucks. I could do the same thing with a nice Ford Taurus and probably buy it for even less than that. And that's a great car to get me back and forth to work for 10 more months while I do it again and do it for 10 more months 
and now I'm driving a $15,000 car 30 months in, paid for. This is called saving up and paying for things. It's a novel idea. It's, it's kind of sweeping the nation. It's different. You know, think it through. Think it through. It'll come to you. Now, the other area is wealth building. Now, when it comes to wealth building, we're going to do that. We're going to cover that in detail in the Of Mice and Mutual Funds lesson where we go into the investment types. And we're also from fruition to tuition, which is the retirement and college savings lesson. We're going to show you how to shelter that from taxes with the different government programs and so forth. But for purposes of just looking at math for a few minutes, wealth building requires a key ingredient, and that is discipline. Discipline is a key ingredient when it comes to wealth building. Now, I've got to tell you, I don't like discipline. Anybody that just says, I like discipline, you're kind of weird, you know? That's kind of a sickness, you know? I mean, I like discipline. Yeah, I don't want to go there. That's kind of, that's out there a little bit, okay? But I tell you what, I do, what li I do like in my life what discipline produces. When I am disciplined in taking care of my body, I like that I feel better and I'm a little thinner. When I am disciplined in taking care of my money, I like that I have some. That's a big, hairy deal, you know? It works that way. And the Bible talks about this. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That is a powerful set of sentences right there. Don't miss that. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. We can all admit that. When I go out running, some mornings it's early and I don't want to get up, that isn't pleasant at the time. But when I get to work later that day after doing a few miles, I feel better, don't I? Same thing with my money. No discipline seems pleasant when I'm doing it, but then when I need a little money to buy a car or take care of my child or send my kid to college or something, I've got some. It's not pleasant at the time, but it produces a harvest that is powerful. Building wealth is a marathon. It is not a sprint. That you, you can't get rich quick. Everybody's looking for a shortcut. Everybody's watching midnight cable TV. I'm going to order this tape set, and they've got magic pills, and, and it's easy. And, and it's not easy. It's not easy. Building wealth is hard. Otherwise, everybody would be rich. It's tough, but it's worth it. And anybody that tells you it's easy, and anybody that tells you they've got a shortcut, and anything that sounds too good to be true is? It's not going to be, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. If it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. That's the process. Wealth is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And we live in a culture where we don't want to focus on anything. The whole culture is ADD. You know what I'm talking about? We just, we're just all, we're all crazy, you know? We can't keep our eyes on nothing. I mean, talking on a cell phone, putting on the makeup, driving with your knee. I mean, come on. Get out of the left lane. You know, I mean, come on, right? Concentrate on something. Focus on something. And if you do that long term, that's a marathon, and wealth is a marathon. Anybody that tells you it's a sprint is not smart. Stay away from them. It's not going to work. All the wealthy people I talk to say, Dave, it's a process over time. Here's an example. What if you saved your pizza money or your cable money? $100 a month. Now, some of you spend $150 on cable and $600 on pizza. But by average, let's just say you took $100 a month and you were to save that from age 25 to age 65, your working lifetime, and you were to invest that steady every single month in a good growth stock mutual fund, and we'll talk about that in the investment lesson, and you were to average 12% on your money. If you were to save just $100 a month, at age 65, you'd have $1,176,000. You'd be a millionaire. Say, wow. Wow. No one in our culture should retire broke. And yet, many, many people are. A hundred dollars. Dave, well, I ain't seen a hundred dollars. That's because you got car payments and furniture payments. Because you didn't save up and pay for them. A hundred bucks is not that much money in most people's household. A hundred dollars. And you retire with dignity. Just a hundred bucks. I was speaking to a group of high school seniors a while back, and the teacher said, Dave, talk to these kids about what smoking costs. So we discussed it in there for a few minutes, and we came up and we said, well, gosh, you know, what if it was like a pack a day? And we said, okay, maybe $3 a day. So let's do the math a minute. $3 times 30 days is what? Three times 30 is $90 invested. So if you were to invest that much from age 16 to age 76, you'd have $11.6 million. This kid in the back goes, whoa, dude, what do you do with that much money? I said, you change your family tree. Maybe this time it'll fork. (laughs) 
Now, now I don't smoke, but I have been known to go get me a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And that's like, a friend of mine calls it five bucks. <laughs> right? What if you spent five bucks a day at Starbucks? Here's the numbers on that one from age 16 to 76. That's starting early with your coffee. But that's $150 a month. That's $19 million. That coffee smells bitter to me. There's a problem here. You have to think through this. Now, how am I going to do this? How am I going to build this discipline? I got to tell you, I'm just like you. I'm busy. I'm running in 19 directions. I have to have kind of autopilot discipline. So I used pre-authorized checking withdrawals, which is a good way to build discipline. Because if it zaps my account, if those mutual funds come along to my account and they go, smack, <coughs> right? That account just gets hit really hard at the first of the month, and it automatically moves over to that mutual fund. It happens whether I'm out of town. It happens whether I'm on vacation. It happens whether I'm too busy to sit down and do the checkbook. It happens. And my savings is automatic every month. I need that discipline. I need that automated process to be able to save that way. That is a good way to do it. And what we're trying to create here with wealth building is a compound interest which creates a mathematical explosion. Now, compound interest works like this. Let's say that we had $1,000. And to make the math easy so you can help me right quick, let's say we made 10% on the $1,000. 10% of $1,000 is $100. Now, if I left that money in the account, the 1,000 plus the 100, the next year I would have 1,100, wouldn't I? And I would earn 10% on that, which would be $100. $10, right? So the next year I'd have $1,210. And it keeps building up. And every time it builds up, it gets a little more interest every time because you're not only getting interest on the principal, but you're getting interest on the interest that you've built up. And that is a powerful, powerful process. The trick is you've got to start right now. You've got to get with it. We've got to get these, these emergency fund out of the way and start paying cash for things so that we don't have any debt so that we can build some wealth. And as we start really doing our investing, we get to see the power of compound interest. Ben and Arthur discovered that. Ben is, well, he's a bright young man. At 19 years old, he decided to start saving $2,000 a year. He did that from age 19 all the way to age 26. Now, at age 26, how much money did Ben add to his account personally? He used to put in 2,000, but at age 26, or at age 27, how much did he put in? Zero. He didn't put another dime in, did he? And after that, his interest just earned interest, and his money earned interest, and it, the snowball kept rolling over and over and over. Now, his brother Arthur doesn't put any money in, because he's out playing and goofing off and spending everything he makes, right? He acts like he's the government or something. He spends more than he makes. And so he finally wakes up at 27 years old and says, I'm going to save $2,000 just like my brother. And he does that from age 27 all the way to age 65. Now think with me on this. Arthur, who has put in $78,000, is behind Ben, who put in only $16,000 by over $700,000. Let me say that again so you get it. The guy who put in $78,000 got beat by the guy who put in $16,000 by $700,000 just because the other guy started earlier. Wow! Some of you are going, Dave, that's a real neat example if I was 19. <laughs> How many of you in here are under age 25? Raise your hand. Very cool. Do you understand that if you understand that chart we just did and all the implications that it means and you cause those implications to affect your behavior, I just completely made you a multimillionaire if you get that one chart. See, I don't think you ought to be allowed to graduate from college or high school until you can explain that chart. It'll change your life to get that one thing. Now, how many of you in here are like me? You're over 45 years old. Raise your hand. Be proud of it. Good. Now, maybe you've got something kind of boiling inside of you right now. <laughs> maybe you've got something you want to say to those people in here that are under 25 years old. Maybe you would like want to yell at them something like, do it, on three. One, two, three. Do it! Young people, did you hear the voice of regret? 
Now, those of you that are over 45, it's not over. You still got plenty of time. You just don't have as much time. And all you got is all you got. So let's work with what you got. Okay? So let's get going wherever you are. Some people say, well, am I too old to shave money? <laughs> not if you're still sucking wind. <laughs> you're going to make it. There's all kinds of things you do. You know, Colonel Sanders never fried any chicken commercially until he was 67 years old. Isn't that amazing? Golden Meyer, Church, Winston Churchill did everything they did in their 60s and 70s. My, my family and I were blessed a couple of years ago. We were able to visit the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And as we were taking the tour with this tour lady, she said, she, she pointed to the back wall of the Sistine Chapel, which is this huge, huge masterpiece of the return of Christ. And it was painted, she said, by a 78-year-old Michelangelo. It's not over until you quit. So wherever you are, you start now. But let's get with it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. If you're 19, mm, you got to do this stuff. If you're 45, let's go. Let's get this done. <laughs> There's some stuff to do here, people. Let's get moving. The rate of return of the interest rate that you get on your money is very, very important as well. Something to look at. See, here's an example of that. If you take $1,000 and you put it in the bank and you made 6% on your money and you put it in there at age 25 and you let that compound interest work, you come back 40 years later, at 6%, that $1,000 will be $10,000. If you double the rate of return from 6 to 12%, it doesn't double the results, does it? Because compound interest is a mathematical explosion. 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 2. So when you go from 6 to 12, we don't go from 10 to 20. We go from 10,000 to $93,000. And when you triple it and you go from 10, or you go from 6 to 12 to 18, it doesn't go from 10 to 20 to 30. It goes from 10 to 93, and you made 18% on your money, you'd have 750 thousand dollars. Dave, you can't get 18% on your money. You know that. Well, I sort of do. I've got several mutual funds that have averaged over that for 20 years. I really don't think that's a reasonable amount to expect in the coming years. And I don't run my calculations for my future based on 18%, but I've actually owned some conservative investments that have done that. We'll talk about that in another lesson. But I have found a place where you really can get 18% on your money. It's... um. called plastic surgery. Because mathematically, not paying out 18% is suspiciously like receiving it. <laughs> you see, what happens to us is this. We, you know, we take the $1,000 down to the bank, and we open up a bank account. And as we do that, we put the key in the engine of the most sophisticated and well-funded marketing machine ever known to man, and we start the machine. The machine is called the financial institution. They spend more money selling their product and are more sophisticated at selling their product than any other industry. They are absolutely professional marketers. They are very, very good at what they do. So if you go open a savings account, by the time you get home, in your mailbox is one of these, isn't it? And, and it's in there, and it's like, got a little letter in there that says, welcome to the family. We want to build a relationship with you. And, and I got that thing out, and I read it, and it said 18%. And I went, nobody borrows money at 18%. That'd be stupid. I'm not going into debt at 18%. I was in my 20s, and I told my wife, I said, honey, got this stupid credit card, 18%. We don't need the thing. But I'm going to put it right here just in case there's an emergency. Oh, no, you did it too. <laughs> and we're sitting there doing the bills one week, and there's sweat on the upper lip, and we're fighting, and we're not going to make it, and we're going, okay, honey, i got a plan. We'll eat every other week. <laughs> we're just barely making it. You know, all the money comes in, all the money goes out, only the names are changed to protect the innocent. Anybody been there but me? You know what I'm saying? And Monday morning, we mail all the bills out, and then they're out there floating around in the mail. And about Thursday, I go to start the car, and the car won't start. It's got a bumper sticker on it. It says, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. <laughs> I've got to have the car to get to work. I mean, how am I going to get to work to pay these bills if I don't have the car? A stupid car won't start. It's a $422 alternator. So we take the Tahoe down to the mechanic. Turns out he's not a nonprofit ministry. He actually wanted to get paid. We said, well, just this once, we're going to fix the car, because who knew the car was going to break? 
And we're going to put it on this thing because this is an emergency. Yeah. And we're sitting there about August, and, and the kids come in the house kind of like this. Dad? <laughs> Dad? <laughs> Dad? Dad, we're getting ready to go back to school, and Dad, this is a problem. <laughs> Dad, we're either going to have to buy clothes or you're going to have to pay for counseling. And we're going, oh no, the children grew. Who knew this was going to happen? <laughs> so we go down to Target, that fine French store, <laughs> and take care of our children and buy them clothing because they surprised us by growing. <laughs> we have no money. And so we put it on this because this is an emergency. emergency. I'm sitting there in November eating my Thanksgiving dinner and about halfway through it, I almost choke on my turkey because <laughs> I suddenly realized that this year Christmas is in December. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how Christmas sneaks up on us like they move it or something? It's always there. It's not a shock. That's where it is. It's December. Why is this a shock? And then we get all stupid, right? Oh, we have to get little Johnny some plastic stuff. We have to run down to Toys R Them and get some plastic stuff for little Johnny. Because little Johnny's little self-esteem will be damaged if he doesn't get some plastic stuff. And if his little self-esteem is damaged, he will kill 87 people with an ax. And he'll, he'll be in the, in the prison, and the prison psychologist will say, little Johnny, why did you kill 87 people with an ax? He said, because I didn't get an Elmo when I was four. And it'll be all my fault. And this is how parents think. And the kid's going, I just wanted Elmo. <laughs> and those of us that are Christians, of course, we Christianize our stupidity. It's Jesus' birthday. <laughs> Jesus said to get the little children plastic stuff. <laughs> it says it in second hesitations. <laughs> and so we go down to the mall with no money to buy presents for people we don't really like. <laughs> and 68% of you, that's seven out of 10 of you, while you were down there shopping with no money for people you didn't like, bought yourself a gift. <laughs> Just cause they might forget, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> and what we do, we put it, we put it on this thing cause, cause we didn't know Christmas was coming. So it's in. <laughs> So we're sitting there in February. The bill comes. There's $1,000 on the visa bill. We yell through the house at our spouse, get in here. <laughs> Who put $1,000 on the visa? We were not going to use the visa. And your spouse goes, uh, that would be you. <laughs> and you're going, wasn't me, it was you. And you have a good visa fight. <laughs> And if you have a really good one, you do a full audit on the thing to see who caused the problem. And when you do this, you will discover not that you bought a really nice HDTV, not that you bought a rosewood dining room set or went to Hawaii. You will discover that life happened without a plan and Visa caught your slack. Guess who had a plan? Visa. Think about it. Here's what we really did, folks. We really took $1,000 of our money, we took it down to the bank, and we loaned it to the bank at 6% if we got a really good account. And then they loaned us our $1,000 back at 18%. Now that's a bargain. <laughs> that's how banks make money. Now, I'm not mad at banks, but when I really got stopped and started thinking about this, I thought, you know what, that's stupid. This isn't working. Because if you look real carefully at this chart, you will see that little red one over 6% there. It, it, it really doesn't represent a little red bar. It really looks more like your house. And that big one over 18 looks more like their building. <laughs> so when Sharon and I discovered this, we said, uh-uh, we're not playing anymore. I don't like the game. It's not win-win. It's they win, I lose. I'm out. No, thank you. So what we're saying in short is this, if the water in this cup represents money, 
we need to put some money in the savings cup. If we save money for emergencies, and there's an emergency, we just fix the car, right? It's not a problem. If we save money for retirement, and we get ready to retire, and we want to do that with dignity, we just retire with dignity. If we save money and we want to buy something really nice, like a leather couch or a boat or something that you really want, you save up and pay for it, you just buy the boat. It's not a problem. You write a check, you give them cash, whatever. You could save money for your kid's college, and then they wouldn't graduate like most college seniors will graduate this year with tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt. But we don't put enough money in this cup. Many people put, as we said, no money in this cup. Instead, we have the tendency to use this cup, the spending cup. And we didn't tend to put all of our money in there so that there's not any. And the problem is when you do this, that when you put all your money in the spending cup, that it's gone. David Copperfield does finance. Okay, now. <laughs> All right, now, what I want you to do is, as we wrap this lesson up, I've got a couple things. I want to tell you a story, and I also want you to look at this quickie budget form. Now, the quickie budget form is not a big deal. This is a basic one-page budget form, and so you go home from Financial Peace University your fir after your first session, and you sit down, and you start to think about budgeting. You start to think about spending every dollar on paper before the month begins, and you lay out just the basic budget. Nothing real complicated. We'll get into the whole details of all the budgeting forms and the cash flow planning lesson a little bit later, but for right now, I want you to get started. I want you to come back to class with this thing filled out. Now, we're not going to have anybody investigate and go through and go, oh, no, look what she's spending. We're not doing that. <laughs> we're just going to make sure you're doing this. We want to make sure you're addressing the issue because you can't go through life going la, 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 la and acting like everything's okay because it's not okay. You got to write it down. And when you start putting it down, and those of you that are married, you're going to have a big fight. Get ready. You're going to have a big fight because you haven't been dealing with this stuff. And you're going to be going, look at that. Look at that. Okay, don't have a big fight. This is amnesty, okay? Just be calm. Be quiet, gentle with each other, and begin to lay this thing out for the first time. Well, there's plenty of time for fighting later. I'll show you how, okay? <laughs> but for right now, I want you to just have this as an assignment. It's your homework assignment before your next class period. Have your basic, quickie budget done. Now, I want to close up with this old story. There once was an old man on the side of the hill. He was known far and wide as being able to answer any riddle. And down in the valley were two young smart alecks. And the smart alecks decided they were going to capture a small bird to trick the old man. And they were going to ask the old man, is the bird alive or is the bird dead? And if the old man said the bird was alive, they would crush it and kill it. Yuck. And if the old man said the bird was dead, they'd let it go. And either way, they had him. So right with their plan, they got up early one morning and they captured a small bird. And as the mist is rising off the side of the mountain, we see them going up the mountain trail to the old man's house and they knocked on his door. And the old man came out to the door on his cane and they said, tell me, sir, what do we hold in our hand? And he said, I perceive from the fluttering and the chirping that you hold a small bird. Right you are, they said. Now tell us, old man, is the bird alive or is the bird dead? Now, the old man, he thought, he thought, if I say that bird is alive, they'll crush it and kill it. And if I say that bird is dead, they'll let it go. And either way, they got me. So he thought a moment more, and he raised his eyes to meet theirs. And with the wisdom of the ages, the old man said, the bird is as you will it. See, that's the way it is with money. It's your choices that matter. The bad news about my life is I went through losing everything. Foreclosed, sued, almost lost my marriage, and bankrupt and had to start completely over in my 20s. The good news is I made different choices after that. And now here, many, many years later, God has poured his blessings on our family because we're doing the stuff the way he teaches. This stuff works, but you got to make the choices. It is as you will it. Thanks for being here. So it's as you will it. 
That's right. You have to make a decision to embrace this process. Financial Peace University is not just about head knowledge. We are about changing your behaviors. The small group discussions, the class material is going to mess with you because we're going to well, we're going to push your buttons because we're asking you to change and change is difficult. It's hard. But it's worth it. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. So embrace the pain of change and embrace every aspect of this class. Plug into the small group discussions. Make sure you're doing your homework. Make sure you're doing your budget. Make sure you're communicating with your spouse for those of you that are married. Make a decision to take this information and put it not just in your head but in your heart. Change your behaviors permanently. In this 91 day process we're going to teach you how to handle money and it absolutely works every time if you work it. So take whatever level you want to take but I suggest hitting this on the emotional, the spiritual, the relational, the mathematical, the financial levels, whatever level is there. Take them all in and change the way you handle money permanently. Don't miss a single class. Be early and stay late. It's only 91 days and it could set habit patterns in place that could transform your entire life and for that matter your family tree. Don't miss a second. Make the decision to win. It is as you will it.